gentlemen, please welcome on stage Fahad Al Ajlan, President, King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center, Dr. Saad Al Barak, former Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Oil and Minister of State for Economic and Investment Affairs, Q8, Arnaud Pieton, CEO, Technip Energies, Takayuki Weda, CEO and President, Impex, Moderator, Halima Croft, Managing Director and Global Head of Commodity Strategy, RBC Capital Markets. Thank you so much for joining us for this panel on financing net zero, or as I would like to say, the show me the money panel. First of all, I would like to thank Lorenzo for once again hosting such an exceptional conference in this extraordinary city. So to set the scene, we've just come off of a very successful COP28. Congratulations, Dr. Sultan al Jaber, with a number of very important climate commitments made but a really lingering challenge in terms of where are the trillions of dollars going to come from to meet these ambitious climate goals. And so to sort of set the stage on the, the urgency of the financing challenge, I would like to turn first to His Excellency, Dr. Al Barak, to sort of set the stage on really what is required in terms of financing to meet the net zero challenge. Thank you. Uh the, I think the theme of the conference is energizing change. So really change is the challenge and it's tough and it is extremely painful because the critical path is changing the culture and mindset of people who are engaging uh, the whole world. That's why uh, 70 to 90 percent of mergers and acquisitions fail according to Harvard Business Review. Uh, because the issue is a change of culture. And also, all studies uh, indicate very clearly that to change a culture uh, of a small company, which is less than 1,000 people, uh, you need seven to 10 years. Uh, so the issue is not technology change. Uh, technology change might facilitate change in general, but the critical path is the change of the culture which takes a long time. There is a lag always uh, of probably seven to 10 to 15 years, depending on the type of change between the presence of the tools and the uh, engagement and the realization of change. Uh, and therefore, uh, to, uh, the world have been centered around uh, oil and its derivatives as the energy source. To go to renewables is also a change of culture, especially uh, to uh, people like us who are oil-centric and energy-centric countries uh, in the world. Uh, and uh, without uh, really, uh, it's, it's a symphony, as, as some uh, documents say, you need a symphony and the choir uh, to uh, conduct this symphony of cooperation bet led by governments and uh, participated with by the stakeholders. Uh, and without this symphony and the orchestra playing well, uh, change could not happen. Change usually is very tough in one organization, let alone if you want to uh, realize change uh, across the world, across different culture, conflicting interests and, uh, and ulterior motives. And we could see that uh, in the latest COP28 uh, and the uh, confrontation between those who produce and rely, rely completely on oil and uh, mainly Western economies, uh, just uh, this is not a political classification, uh, but and the pressure, uh, the undue pressure that have been practiced on the oil producing countries and OPEC uh, to, uh, you know, you'll, you'll tell somebody, come and change your blood in no time. Uh, definitely this is extremely risky and shaky. And uh, you can't do that, you, you cannot pursue economic uh, objectives and life objectives 
with a mixed agenda. And I think the biggest challenge today in renewables and uh, uh, zero, uh, net zero finance and stuff like this is the conflicting ulterior motives and world politics. Without significant improvement in politics and an agenda united around humanity and its objective, its ideal objectives, you can never realize many of these things. And what, what's happening in the area of finance, uh, it, it needs leadership by governments because any infrastructural change uh, is not economically feasible for the private sector. You need to engage many tools led by the government and government's leadership uh, is doubtful uh, in, in, in making such transformation in the world. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I, again, it's, it's a cultural change on the level, on the state level, on the world level, as well as l the level of organizations itself. You know, for example, one of the hardest organizations to change is the oil companies and the energy companies around the world. They are mammoths, uh, mainly owned by states and their political obligations and so on. And uh, to change, you need an agile, free, flexible, uh, and, and therefore to change the, the, uh, the uh, culture of such companies is also a massive a challenge. People are scared by the forecast of trillions of dollars needed for renewables and to finance net zero. But we need to understand that uh, between the years 1900 and 2000, in, in the last century, as Gary Hamill, professor of Harvard, stated, uh, the world GDP per capita moved from $900 to $9,000. So it's 10 times in that uh, century. Uh, today, uh, the, uh, the, I mean, the, this century, the 21st century, uh, the year 2000, the GDP was uh, almost 30, 34 trillion dollars. Today, uh, uh, 2023, GDP is estimated to be 105 trillion dollars. In the year 250, 2050, it is expected and forecasted, and I think this is a conservative uh, forecast, the GDP would be more than 270 trillion dollars. So when you say trillions, it, you must put it in the right context, and the right context is what would be the state of eco economy and economic growth at that time? The main challenge in the whole thing is not the financing, the processes, the tools. The main challenge is leadership. Yeah. And without uh, uh, super leadership from the leaders in the world, uh, especially the big guys, and the way they handle and approach things, a change will not be realized in time, and it's going to hurt big time. So the importance of leadership and a cultural mind shift. Fahad, Capstork was a very important knowledge partner in the run-up to COP28. You produced a, I thought, an extraordinary report looking at the financing challenges, particularly honing in on the issue of developing nations and how you can essentially unlock the financing to ensure that we have an equitable transition. So I'm just wondering if you could touch on some of the points that you raised in that important report. Uh, thank you, Halima, uh, for having me. And just for those who don't know, CAPSARC is an advisory think tank that is focused on energy and sustainability and is based in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, so in our report that we issued just before the global stock take, uh, we focused on financing and the investment that is needed to achieve the net zero and the global transition toward clean energy. And what we have said is, if you look globally, we need almost to double the investment uh, that is currently happening in order to achieve that. Uh, but this is just looking at a global level, and the estimate is between three to eight trillion dollars uh, per year in fixed dollars. So that number has just increased as the cost of living and inflation has hit higher. But this is just looking at globally. So we're talking about two to six percent of global GDP just going into clean energy investment. However, when we look at a regional level, we see differences, huge differences. If you look at the EU, EU only needs to increase their investment by 40 percent 
the U.S. needs to double that investment. China is about the only country and region that is actually almost meeting that investment need for the clean energy transition. But if you look at the global economy and if you look at the developing world, excluding China, investment need to increase by five to ten times, depending on the region. So if we're talking about a just and equitable transition, we need to look at those figures and be very cautious about where we're headed. And if you look at the loss and damage fund, which was announced on the first day and completed on the first day of COP28, I think the commitment was under $1 billion, I think $700 million. So we have a long way to go. And I think if we're looking at you know, just the development fund, and a lot of these countries don't even have the financial system to actually help them adjust and get those investments ready. So we need to really address this issue about inequality and about you know, the, uh, the pace of the transition and making sure that it progresses globally rather than focused on a few regions. Arno, so the same question to you on the scale, but also to take it to the what is to be done in terms of what can we think about in terms of public-private partnerships? Yeah, so I will start with, uh, you, you started with a punchline that was show, show me the money or show yes. us the money. So the money is not with us. Yeah. And so contractors <laughs> are not going to fund that transition, but we are enablers to the transition and we are part um, of the solution. So. We need to act now. I think there's a consensus around that. And um, to respond to the scale of the challenge, we collectively must rise to the challenge of scale. Right. I think the panelists before us discussed a lot about we need to get going and we, don't, we need more than just a few refueling, refueling stations here and there. We need scale. It was about hydrogen. And we do need scale. And what was striking yesterday, about um, when His Excellency Altani was on stage uh, describing the amazing trajectory of Qatar with LNG. Look at where they are today, where they were 30 years ago. Not nowhere, but certainly not where they are today. They were small-ish when compared to where they stand today. But yet, 30 years ago, they started with three trains of 3 million tons, or 3.3, if I recall the, the, the curve. Not three trains of a few hundred, hundreds of thousands of tons. They went for scale and people who followed them went for scale. Right. So, if we want to get going, we need to, get for, we need to go for scale. Um, people need to take risk, and when I say people, is uh, us as enabler of the net zero solutions, our customers, the off-takers, the people who are going to fund that thing as well. And at the moment, the, <laughs> what is uh, quite extraordinary is that companies like us, or like Becker Hughes and, and others, are trying to syndicate this effort. I don't think we should be, it's our role to syndicate that effort. I think uh, it's the role of you know, the banks and, and, and you know, a different type of leadership to help us get there. And the scorecard remains the same for, you know, at the moment for companies like ours and, and others, whether you go big on you know, low carbon solution or not. I'm not sure it's right that we continue to have the same ratings and the same scorecard, whether you know, you're, you're after short term returns or, you know, preparing the future. So maybe there's something to be, uh, to be um, you know, about private-public partnership and the rest, that there's something to be reinvented, the notion of companies in transitions. Yeah. Why should I be penalized because I'm investing money into something that is going to make money, but back to the Qatar curve, I am in the 80s and not yet in 2030, but they were so right. And I'm not sure what was the scorecard at the time of their investment, but I'm pretty sure that it was pretty bold. So I think we need to get a lot more bold in terms of scale and the... Uh, Alita the same question to you. You know, you represent an oil and gas company that's, you know, really focused also on the transition. How do we take this to scale? Like, how do we create the enabling environment to unlock the financing? Yeah, well, thank you very much. I think I would like to begin with uh, the kind of success of COP28. I think one of the historical achievements in COP28 was that I think many uh, large emitting industries and companies should play a very important role in the process of decarbonization. I think before the COP28, uh, many uh, environmentalists, NPOs, were play the central role for uh, decarbonization. But now, 
uh, thanks to the Dr. Sultan of UAE. Now, I think large emitting countries, such as oil and gas countries, cement countries, petrochemical countries, those emitting companies should play the central role to reduce carbon dioxide. I think this was the very successful and historical achievement in COP28. So in terms of the culture, uh, changing the mindset, now I think many industries now understand this is a time for us to do something in a serious manner, not just to say something, but to act, make some action in a serious manner. That I think one of the most important achievements of COP28. However, uh, when we consider how to do it, how to make the action, I think, uh, of course, uh, in order to supply a lot of clean energy, such as hydrogen, scale is, of course, important. Without scale, I think we can never uh, provide enough and affordable energy uh, to the society. But in order to do those, financing is, of course, very much important. I think that in order to get the finance, we need uh, some uh, financing from banks and uh, financial institutions. Uh, usually, they require you long-term con con contract, long-term uh, 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 buying a contract uh, between suppliers and uh, uh, cust customers. So uh, the question is, who can provide, who can agree about the long-term uh, contract of uh, our supply of hydrogen? We have the technology of uh, production of hydrogen. Well, we have the money uh, to make an investment for the hydrogen sector. But I think without the demand, I think we cannot never uh, uh, construct the hydrogen production plant. And uh, in terms of financing, uh, without uh, the long-term contract of hydrogen uh, usage, I think uh, banks and the financial institutions will never provide us uh, the, the appropriate financing, especially in the shape of project of finance. However, if we look at the world, I think the demand for hydrogen or ammonia is uh, not so much enough. Many industries are very much hesitate uh, to uh, make a long-term commitment to buy the hydrogens or green ammonia. Someone says that uh, there is a similarity uh, between hydrogen usage and uh, natural gas or energy usage. But truth is different. In the case of natural gas or LNG, there was actually demand before the natural gas is introduced. Many industries have already used uh, not gas uh, produced from coal in advance. So there was a demand. So they don't, there is no reason for those industries to hesitate to make a long time commitment to buy the natural gas or energy at that moment. So I think to have the long term contract uh, for natural gas or energy seems to be very, very easy. But in contracts, in the case of hydrogen and so nuclear ammonia, uh, I think industry, there seems to be uh, not so much enough uh, demand. They really hesitate to make a long term com commitment. So without long term commitment, uh, financial institutions would never provide us with the appropriate financing that resulting in the uh, no construction of plan. So I think there is perhaps a need for the government to intervene uh, this situation, uh, to bridge the supply side and the demand side, uh, to provide appropriate subsidies, appropriate regulatory framework to bridge those supply side and uh, uh, custom side, side seems to be very much important. I want to follow up on this really important point in terms of what's the policy enabling environment required you bring up the issue of the long-term contracts for hydrogen. Others have brought up the issue of the necessity for carbon markets. I'm going to throw this question to Fahad, and then we'll go down the, the row in terms of really what's required in terms of this enabling backdrop. So I think if we look at you know, the energy transition, what we have been saying about the energy transition, it's going to be cleaner, it's going to be cheaper, and it's going to be more secure. And it cannot be all of those three together. And so I think we have to have this realization that energy is going to be ex more expensive. If you look at clean hydrogen, or you look at the cost of CCUS, 
these are costs that government and taxpayer may, may have to put up with at the beginning and incentivize, as we have seen with the IRA. But at one point, it has to be translated into energy costs that's passed to consumers and industry who will then pass it to consumers. So we have to be uh, you know, um, honest with, us, with ourselves and say that. I think it's very misleading to say that we're going to be spending 3 to 6% of GDP on an energy transition that's not going to be more productive, but it's not going to be more expensive. And so I think we have contradicting messages. And so it's very important that we actually uh, be honest on that. I think smart government policy can help, anchoring technologies, anchoring initial demand to create markets. And I think we've seen this in the past with LNG markets about how they develop. Yes, there was an existing gas market, but LNG technology was new. And for that market to, to be liquid and to have depth, government intervention, especially government of Japan, did a wonderful job of creating this. And I think this is what we're seeing with some of the uh, policies we're seeing with the IRA, with the EU Green Deal, we are seeing with Saudi, with NEOM, and other countries that are investing in hydrogen. But I think we have to be realistic and we have to be pragmatic. And so blue hydrogen, if we talk about hydrogen, should be a bridge to green hydrogen. And I think this is important because the cost is prohibitive today. And I don't think the industry is ready to shoulder that cost. And so we need government support, but we need smart government support. And if you allow me to be just one second to talk about government support that's not very smart. If you look at the EV incentive that's being offered globally, for a cost of abatement per ton of CO2, we're talking about an incentive or a subsidy of $300 to $3,000. So if you look at the industry, the cost of abatement is between $50 and $100. So we're paying three to 30 times higher than that to subsidize EV. A better solution may be subsidizing hybrid rather than EV. So we need to be careful about the money that we have and that government is spending to be more fact-driven and you know, science-driven rather than you know, focused on industrial policy. Your Excellency, Dr. Al-Baraki, you have had many positions, highest levels of government, industry. How do we think about the, the smart government support? Well, I do not believe any government would be ever smart. <laughs> smart. <laughs> Smartness is in the free innovative world of the private sector. Uh, governments must be driven by positive forces that change the world, whether it's economic or human uh, or, or, or values based. So uh, governments are chosen uh, by people and therefore it's people's choice that decides what type of government we have. The issue here is really uh, uh, an, an, any new technology to be developed, especially in these sensitive areas, is cost prohibitive. And we know this. Uh, the, we need uh, not only to re revolutionize the thinking of government, but also on the finance institutions and banks. I think banks and the world still belong to the last century. <laughs> they don't see the realities of today. They don't have the agility uh, the will, they don't have any passion for business adventure in general. They want guarantees more than value addition. And therefore, that's why I go back to a cultural change. The world where it was when it was fighting each other in the beginning of the century, last century, and, and today is a much more peaceful, uh, uh, relatively, still we have big problems, but much more peaceful. That's, that's a cultural change. That also the change in technologies, the mobile industry, for example, and it facilitated information, uh, uh, speed and efficiency and so on. Uh, where did the, how did the financial institutions change uh, accordingly to the new realities of the world? Until today, if you go to get a loan from the bank, they will even take your children's as pawn on, and, uh, <laughs> in order to make sure you repay your loan. I mean, there is snags and uh, bottlenecks uh, that are there because of the old thinking, because the thinking have not changed, the mindset have not changed. And without revolutionizing 
the uh, financial systems in general and keeping, of course, the governance on it, but it needs to be uh, more facilitated, uh, facilitated uh, deregulation in many areas in order to realize this, uh, the alliance that has to be born between governments uh, uh, as leaders, private capital, uh, research institutions, and all the civil society uh, across the world, plus co collaboration without mixed political agendas uh, between countries. I think that needs to happen uh, at the level of leadership before we can realize uh, any maturity of any new uh, renewable energy. Arno, same question to you, but I also want to bring in the issue of elections because 2024 is the year of elections all over the world. And so is there a risk, you know, A, what policies are necessary, but are you concerned and are the other panelists concerned about a, a policy reversal in certain key countries that we could lose momentum when it comes to the transition? I think we should all be concerned. Um, the last thing we need is uh, start and stops. Yeah. Right? Uh, otherwise, we're just losing the momentum always. So um, let's see. Uh, yeah, half, of, half of the population is going to vote this, uh, this year. But um, the world sorry, is, is, is calling to vote. But um, yeah, the, the risk is there. Uh, for sure, it's inherent to, to elections. Uh, now, I, you know, as an individual, uh, I hope that um, uh, you know governments and uh, and I'm not the only one to realize that you know back to the sense of urgency. Yeah. Uh, but the sense of urgency um, is, I would say, meaningless if there's no sense of agency. Co so governments, individuals, uh, companies, banks, and you know need to act accordingly and and you know supporting the trajectory. And if we don't have, if we only have the sense of urgency and no sense of agency, which governments and, and others are you know, able to put together, then you walk into a situation of despair. It's just like a very doomed scenario because people don't know, they don't feel that you know, there's something bigger than themselves that is happening. So I, yes, there's a risk uh, yeah. to answer your question, but I sure hope that uh, um, the, the new governments will uh, continue to instill and de deploy this sense of, uh, of agency that is needed to uh, respond to the sense of urgency. One uh, comment about um, you know, scale and demand. Um, about scale, it's about reaching the tipping point so that companies like Technip Energies and, and uh, Baker Hughes was inviting us today, thank you, uh, are able to deploy at scale. You need to reach that tipping point and beyond the tipping point, things get better in terms of, in terms of cost per ton or, or whatever of the, of the product. And you're right, governments today are investing in some areas, say electrolyzers, but they're not investing into, well, I need to facilitate the demand for, for, for hydrogen or byproducts of hydrogen. And that's a concern because they are only investing in one fold and, and not on the complete value chain. So that's, so if you don't have the complete value chain, you have only a partial answer to the, to the, to the topic. Um, the answer also needs to be, it's not about one technology, it's multiple technologies. Because, and I think for the demand to take off, you need the product to be easily usable by the existing infrastructure. So if it's not hydrogen, can it be e-natural gas? Can it be ammonia? We know that. Can it be something else? And that's why the, there is success for SAF, sustainable aviation fuels, because you can blend SAF with, you know, it's same connection, same pipeline, same whatever, same hoses to the planes. And SAF, today it's BioSAF, tomorrow will be eSAFs, and it depends on what is, what is it that you have in your local jurisdiction. Sure. What's the feedstock? So again, it's not about a single technology, it's about adopting money. And so, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, the demand is there, it can be created, but uh, the, the support system needs to acknowledge that it's not a big bang, it's multiple technologies, so let's not do any discrimination of that one is good or not. No, actually what is needed at the moment depends on sometimes the region or the state. That's the local response that is needed. So, but back to the, yeah, the, the, de the demand, let's make sure that we, as industries, we, as enablers of these uh, you know, low carbon solutions, we first um, find a way to bring the price point where it is acceptable to our clients and to the customers, because we shouldn't oppose end of the world and end, no, end of the month. Huh? Uh, so, so that's our job as, uh, as, as contractors. 
but let's turn also the molecule or the product into something that is easily adoptable and can, can sustain without su subsidies. Turning back to the issue, almost of the art of the possible, you brought up the issue about COP28 and the importance of it being in the UAE, the importance of having the role for oil and gas companies, having a seat at the table. I'm also wondering when we think about financing, is the Gulf states the important driver of potential funding? And you have a partnership with Mazdar on e-methane. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that partnership. And again, as we think about different sources of funding, is it really the countries that were the oil and gas producers that are going to lead the funding revolution or the transition? Well, um, I think Mustard is our very important partner. Mustard has the technology, Mustard has the enough money, and uh, they have a very great mindset to change their uh, countries to the very clean energy uh, countries. Of course, the speed is very gradual. I think transition takes a lot of time. However, if we we'll keep continue the uh, partnership with Mustard, and perhaps we will have now the studying the uh, joint project of uh, producing e uh, methane or e petrochemical or e uh, fuel and also e uh, natural gas. I think uh, although the price is still high, very very expensive. I don't think the world is people is ready to accept such high price. But as he said, I think uh, the truth is there is no perfect clean energy which is affordable, which is clean, and which is also cheap. Someone must pay for that. And from the supply side, UAE will become the very good partner uh, with our uh, 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 company, and we will produce some clean energy with Mustar and uh, to try to provide uh, those clean energy to Asia, to Japan, and to some other uh, countries. Well, but I think I would like to mention here about the elections and the political issues. I think energy policy is very complicated and very difficult to understand. What is important at this moment is not to politicize the energy issues at this moment. We all understand there is very one important country. We announced to pose the uh, export of uh, energy to other uh, countries. That is a surprise to all. Now the question arises, is that country, is really a uh, trustworthy country in the energy market? Different from Qatar, who had made a lot of effort and who are very reliable supplier of the LNG. I think such kind of a trust in the market was a basis for uh, the uh, world uh, to uh, entering into the transitions. I, I think such as realism and trustworthy in the market is, a is also the basis for the production of clean energy. So we are in the final moments of this panel, and I just want to go down the line again, and you raised the point, Arno, that we shouldn't pick one technology, but I would like to get your thoughts on Techno. if you could talk about you know, your, the technologies that you are most excited about. It may not just be one, but as we think about the, you know, the technologies for the low carbon future, you know, what makes you most excited? Fahad, we're going to go down the line. Um, so I think for us at Capsai, we started this end of last year and we're continuing this year. I think the use of satellite. I think we're using satellite to monitor emissions, especially methane emissions. The cost has fallen down uh, significantly that you can do it. We've done it for Saudi. We are now doing it for the GCC and MENA area. And you can look and detect, you know, super emitters, especially on time, rather than report to, on them, you know, two years after. So it's very important. And the cost is really insignificant compared to the effect of the technology. Newer satellites are going on space. They're more accurate. And I think we're very you know, determined to actually focus on this for us in the next few years. Your Excellency? Uh, I, I think the, the new technology is the AI. Uh, and unfortunately, AI uh, has been demonized by uh, big people such as Warren Buffett uh, 10 years ago and Bill Gates. Finally, Bill Gates saw the light, so he invested $40 billion in chat 
chat GPT. Anyways, this is an AI company, chat GPT. Yes. Uh, so this, uh, that's the cultural change I want. It took, it took Bill Gates 10 and a half years to understand that uh, uh, his future would be based on AI. I think AI could help in improving processes, efficiencies, transition, and forecasting in a much more effective uh, way than uh, any other technologies and deploying and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, really in, uh, betting on AI uh, as, a few, as a future or current technology would help a lot uh, in even devel the development of uh, renewable energies in general. Uh, I'm sorry, just to oh, give no. an example, okay. uh, an experience, one of the big companies, oil companies, using AI, which they paid only five to six million dollars, uh, that had produced an annual savings of one billion dollars in their operation. So, sorry, please, go ahead. Thank you. So for me, the, uh, well, I will add uh, to complement, maybe the, everything that, uh, that is around power to X. Okay, so I'm not going to, uh, but the, uh, the electron to uh, the molecule for energy storage, uh, there's more nuclear coming, so I think, you know, that is also a source of, uh, of clean electrons that can be used around the world. Um, so anything that is going to help power to x take off uh, would be my answer. And I need to add something about technology, uh, because it's also about the technologies that others have. And we at, at Technip Energies, we formed a company uh, de uh, dedicated to textile, to textile recycling. And I, I'm, mentioning the, I'm mentioning this one because we had to look into other companies' portfolios, and who is partnered with us on this one? A famous brand, and there are more, a famous company, small one, IBM, and Technip Energy. So we are the small uh, uh, kid uh, around that block, but we led, I would say, um, a group of people to actually open a bit their kimono, around this is what we have. We had a, a joint, uh, I would say, ambition, and people contributed their respective technologies or their know-how to forming something new. People who were not meant to be together in the same room initially, but they are now. And so about technologies, it's also about what technologies you have that are maybe sleeping or dormant and can, can be revived and put together, um, you know, again, um, uh, in order to deliver something that is unexpected when you look at it from the outside. So it's that, that partnership and that sense of um, uh, breaking some boundaries is important. Amirasan, you get well, the final word. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. About technology, I'd like to mention three points. One is, I think, at this moment, under the current technological situation, most proven technology to reduce the carbon dioxide is perhaps CCS carbon capture and uh, storage. Now, as technology is there, uh, I think there is still some need uh, to develop the monitoring of CCS underground and to reduce the cost of CCS. Those are the important, but CCS plays a very important role, at least uh, uh, until the year 2040, to reduce the carbon dioxide from even the hydrocarbon energy. So we should develop the CCS technology uh, in co collaboration with other uh, companies. Those are perhaps the most important uh, ta technological uh, issue to be developed uh, for the time being. Second issue is perhaps uh, perhaps and the, after the year 2040, 2050, hydrogen will play a very important role, whatever the green or blue is. Mm -hmm. I think at that moment, like ANNG, we need the kind of transportation of hydrogen technology. I think the, uh, to liquefy the hydrogen is very, very difficult. Like when the, we first uh, consider the liquefaction of natural gas, everybody says it's very difficult. As I think the liquefaction of hydrogen is, of course, very important, but very costly and difficult. Uh, to develop those technologies uh, for the future seems to be a most important technology. And then, sadly, future technology, I believe the uh, nuclear, perhaps nuclear fusion, uh, play an important role in the future. Well, thank you so much. We are out of time for this extraordinary panel. I'd like to thank our panelists for this very enlightening conversation. And once again, thank our fantastic host, Lorenzo. Thank you. Thank you.